What I want to talk about today is the narrative of oppression that underlies the whole political correctness movement. And this narrative holds certain things to be true, true to the point that you're not allowed to question them. Questioning them is not even considered to be a legitimate point of view. And if you should be so foolish as to question them, you will not be refuted. You will simply be hounded out of society. And we all know what I'm talking about. If you make some of the claims that I'll be making here today, you will not be met with a careful, sober, scholarly refutation. Instead, you will be hectored and called names and your motives will be impugned. In a way, it, it is reminiscent of Marxism in that Marx would often say that an opponent of his was obviously simply a pawn of the bourgeois class. It was not necessary so much to refute this person. What we needed to do was unmask his class background because then we would know that that colored all of his thinking. This man belongs to the bourgeois class. Well, likewise, it is sufficient to say, well, so-and-so is a white man. Of course he will say these things. Now, if it so happens that it's a white woman saying these things, or a black woman, or a Hispanic man, or whatever, well, those people are not even human from the point of view of the political correctness movement. They cannot conceive of why people would want to participate in their own oppression, which is the only way they can account for why people might disagree with their conclusions. The primary narrative, of course, as Tom DiLorenzo indicated, is that there is an express and oftentimes implicit oppression, a campaign of oppression against all groups other than white men throughout society. And coupled with this narrative of oppression is an expectation that in the absence of this oppression, we would have equality of economic outcomes in terms of job opportunities and, and, and uh, incomes. And if this equality of outcome is not present, then there must be a sinister reason. There must be a deliberate attempt to bring about unequal outcomes somewhere. And what follows from this, and this is why the Mises Institute would have a particular interest in this, is that state policies to rectify the imbalances are thereby proposed. We need state policies to overturn this outcome, to reverse this outcome, to minimize these differences, and so on. So it's, it's not just that we're dealing with toxic and irrational ideas. It, these are ideas that obviously lend themselves to government intervention. We need government intervention to reverse all these outcomes that we're told are unnatural and would not occur spontaneously. But the presumption that we would have equal outcomes for all groups is based in an extremely, well, I, I, I don't know how to say this here, a, a childish, a juvenile, let's say, a, 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 an approach to society that is so simplistic as to be juvenile. Because the different racial and ethnic groups in the United States differ in all sorts of ways. All sorts of ways that are completely benign. They differ in average age, for example. They differ in their geographical distribution across the country. They differ in their educational levels, and they differ in their culture and their cultural values. And they differ in these ways that are so extraordinary that it would be astonishing if there were equal outcomes among groups, even assuming absolutely pure motives on the part of everybody involved. Let's take a quick example to illustrate what I mean. Japanese American women are only, only 10% of them are married by age 18. But 50% of Mexican American women are married by age 18. That difference alone is going to have a lot to do with educational opportunities, job placement, and so on, because when people get married, it has an impact on these other aspects of their lives. That's just one cultural difference between two groups that right off the bat will in a totally benign way account for many of the differences between them. Now we're told that if there are income differences between groups, this must mean discrimination.
And if one group, let's say, earns more than another, then that group is suffering from less discrimination than the other. And then a group above them is suffering from still less discrimination. So the fact, for example, that Jewish people in the United States earn more on average than Hispanics is taken to mean that anti-Semitism must be of lower intensity than anti-Hispanic feeling. That's the explanation for why there are these differences in incomes. Well, then how do we explain the much greater incomes of Jewish people in Hispanic countries? Good question. The answer is, the question is not to be posed. If you pose the question, you're obviously a spokesman of the oppressor class and so on and on. So in other words, you can't even make an argument. The making of an argument is an act of hostility. Or, let's take, we're sometimes told that black Americans have higher infant mortality rates, presumably because they are deprived of prenatal care. They're deprived of access to prenatal care. But Chinese Americans have even lower infant mortality than whites, even though they have less prenatal care. So there are disparities everywhere in American society and around the world. And there would and will be such disparities as long as human beings roam the earth. And there is no reason to expect otherwise. Let me give you a few examples. In 2012, out of the 100 top-ranked marathon runners, 68 were Kenyans. The National Spelling Bee has had an Indian American as the winner for seven consecutive years. Despite being greatly outnumbered by black Americans and slightly outnumbered by black Americans in terms of earning bachelor's degrees, Asian Americans received more than twice as many bachelor degrees in engineering as blacks. Moreover, Asians outnumber blacks despite the fact that they are vastly outnumbered by blacks in the general population. They outnumber them at MIT 3 to 1, 10 to 1 at Harvey Mudd College, and 40 to 1 at Caltech. But even this as Thomas Sowell points out, was not as great as the disparity between Chinese and Malays earning engineering degrees in Malaysia in the 1960s. Students from the Chinese minority in Malaysia, maybe 5% of the population, earned over 100 times as many engineering degrees as students from the Malay majority. And this is in a country where Malays dominate the government and they dominate university policy. So as Sowell says, there are grossly uneven and non-random outcomes from all sorts of purposeful human endeavors. Moreover, serious laws and policies are based on these assumptions that we should expect everything to be equal in defiance of the facts. The Malaysians have never, or I, I beg your pardon, the Chinese minority in Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Thailand have never operated under an equal playing field, and yet most of those nations' total, industry, uh, total investments in key industries are held by this Chinese minority. The Chinese minority has had twice the average income of the Malay majority, despite the fact that they are officially, they've been officially discriminated against. The Italians in Argentina have outperformed native Argentines despite discrimination. The same could be said for Jews, Armenians, East Indians, and more. In the United States, Japanese Americans were so discriminated against that some of them were put into special camps during World War II. And yet, in spite of the temptation to use this as an excuse for poor performance, by 1959, Japanese American households had equaled white households in income, and by 1969, were earning one third more. So there are a lot of disparities, and there are disparities that are the opposite of what you would expect if the narrative of political correctness were true.
that discrimination and oppression must have these sorts of outcomes. Sometimes we have exactly the opposite outcomes because human beings are widely variable and they are in many, many different sorts of circumstances. There are many factors that contribute to various outcomes. It is not, in other words, a comic book. The world is not a comic book in which there is one factor at work and in which everything would be equal if we could just get this one factor just right.